Everyone wants to live an inspired life, yet so many people search for happiness following the footsteps of peers and taking advice from people who have different values and outcomes to which they're searching. There are people born into wealth, graduated from the best universities in the world, and there are people who have none of that and yet are living extraordinary lives full of fulfillment and reward. The purpose of this podcast is to share insights and strategies that allow you to question the status quo and think freely, so you can design your life and be who you want to be. We get one life. Time is our most valuable asset. I believe that when we're free and able to focus on meaningful work, we become better human beings. This is Always Free, and I'm your host, Jason Greystone. Welcome to the leading podcast for financial empowerment and wealth creation. Subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. You can connect with Jason on social media and subscribe to the Jason Greystone YouTube channel for weekly videos. Don't forget to also subscribe to the weekly newsletter to receive frequent educational content and action steps to help you design your life so you can be who you want to be. For news on all future events and updates, go to jasongreystone.com. Well, 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 welcome back to the podcast, guys. Hope you've all had a good week so far. Hope you're still enjoying this amazing weather that we've got. If you're in the UK, it's been like the longest, uh, dry, sunny spell that I've, I've known for a long, long time. And it's only today that it's clouded over a little bit, but still enjoying the, the freedom of time and space in the lockdown, personally. Uh, and if you're listening to this for the first time ever, you know, do, do yourself a, a, a huge favor and go back to number one, listen to episode one and, uh, and start listening from there. Uh, but if you just tuned in and this is the first time you're hearing my mid-tone nasally voice, it is uh, the number one podcast for financial empowerment and wealth creation. And you're in a fantastic place if, if you're on a journey for empowering your personal finances and building wealth. So a uh, great place to be. And today, we're in for a treat today because I've got a really good friend of mine, Gavin, who is an absolute mastermind in property. And Gavin's story is really going to, uh, you know, comp- is so compelling. Uh, the fact that he actually went from, uh, from taking on a business to then achieving full financial freedom uh, where he was so elated, he was on top of the world, and then lost the entire lot, okay? And you're going to hear about the insights, his mindset towards that, and how he then brought it back around, and now he's doing things differently. So honestly, what you're going to learn in this podcast is absolutely invaluable, particularly those of you who are looking to uh, invest in commercial property, or invest at all, really, uh, going forward out of this recession that we're in at the moment. Uh, I want to introduce you in just a minute, but before we go into that, I want to just kind of lead you up to this episode and what it, what to expect, really. Uh, if you've listened to any of the previous episodes, you'll know that I spoke very early on about living an inspired life is really about choosing what you do that is it, that every day that's in alignment to where you want to be in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and really any advice that you get along the way, taking it with a pinch of salt or asking yourself, has that person really got the results that I want or have they, are they living the life that I want or do they have the results that I'm after? And if the answer is no, then just taking that advice with a pinch of salt or listening to or paying attention to some mistakes they've made and really just, just allowing yourself to go, well, actually, they're telling me to do this and they're saying that that's what everyone's always done or that's the status quo or that's the norm or everyone should be doing this it's just the way it's always been and then using that and taking that information and giving yourself permission to say well does it align with my most inspired life does it align with my highest values and where I want to be in five ten years and if you just take the step back to just ask yourself that question and give yourself permission to answer that question you're going to make some very different decisions in your life that will be life-changing decisions, drastic life-changing decisions. And down the road, they can radically shift your destiny, when it comes, particularly when it comes to finances. But most importantly of all, your well-being, your, your, you know, your ability to be, get up every day and feel completely different uh, as to what you might have done full of regret if you'd followed another path. So today we've got a phenomenal guest. Gavin, and Gavin has got some <laughs> some unbelievable experience in the property uh, world, and he's extremely humble. And every time I hear Gavin speak, he's uh, and I can't help but smile at how refreshingly uh, humble he is and honest he is of what he's been through. So, 
Uh, Gavin's going to, we're going to talk a little bit about property investing because uh, I know there's many property investors that are listening to this and with everything going on with COVID and the recession and where we're going into property and how that dynamics changing and how that space is changing. Uh, Gavin's going to share some insights there. But before we get into that, I'll let Gavin introduce himself. So Gavin, first of all, welcome. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Jason. Great to be here. It's Excellent. funny to be on the other side of the uh, of the microphone for a change, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. So you you uh, actually started listening to the podcast, right? Uh, That's right. About That's a year ago. I, yeah, I, I, when I met you at uh, one of Daniel Priestley's uh, things, I remember afterwards sort of saying, oh, I must listen to that podcast you mentioned. And, uh, and as soon as I heard that I went and I took your advice, went right back to the beginning and the journey that you take people through. And I immediately resonated with the kind of uh, the stories you tell and the kind of the sequencing and the mindset. And because, uh, you know, the, the, the career that I've had has been a serious roller coaster ride yeah. and uh, and some of the stuff that if i had had the, your podcast you know 15 years ago i might have gone a very different direction and um, and Amazing. so it's it's kind of interesting to sort of see it in retrospect yeah. i mean i don't have you know a huge amount of regret i always kind of look forward mm -hmm. but i have left a lot of uh, of cash on the table and uh, yeah. and given up a lot of my gains by being kind of reckless and foolish with money and yeah. so it is interesting to hear your thoughts on it and uh, and I kind of sign up to a lot of your philosophies uh, very much now you know amazing so tell us so for, that, for those people who are listening who just to kind of build a background and build some kind of authority uh, in the space tell us a little bit about your your story who you are and what you was up to well if, if I want to go right back to the beginning I'm, I'm from a family business my dad was involved in um, in, in real estate and uh, his dad was involved in real estate in so far as they were house builders. And uh, going back to you know World War II, my grandfather made a bit of a name for himself in the UK, rebuilding after the war. And he, he, he built up the business and then he came back to Ireland and he started building houses across the country. And he, he became quite a big house builder. And my dad went into that business and took over from him, became the chairman. And then they started getting into commercial real estate. But my dad died um, of kind of an unexpected illness that came out of a, of a trip to Africa that he went on. And he came back and three months later, he was dead at the age of 45. And I had just, he literally went to Africa on the day before my 21st birthday. And, and I can remember him having a conversation with me saying, you know, do you mind that I'm not going to be there for your 21st? And I was like, I oh, know it's cool, dad. I got friends from college coming over and whatever. And uh, and then the day after my 21st birthday, he didn't want to ruin my birthday by telling the family that this was happening to him. But he was hemorrhaging blood in Johannesburg, not Johannesburg, Harare in Zimbabwe, which back in 1993 didn't have like hospitals. Things no. like that. So he was basically a goner when this took place. But he managed to hang on long enough to make it back to Ireland and they kind of tried to stabilize him, but it was just the damage was done. He came back to Ireland weighing 40 stone, uh, 40, 40 kilos, I should say. Right. Like, I don't know, whatever, six stone or something like that. And um, and just after a couple of months of fighting for his life, he it, it ended. And so he was a very active businessman who had a lot. He was an angel investor. He had a lot of investments in various places, but he was a risk taker and an entrepreneur and I can remember after, you know, the day after the funeral, chatting with my mom and she started opening all of the post that had built up over three months for my dad. And we didn't open it because we kind of thought when dad gets well, he can open his post. And suddenly you're opening up and you see, Jesus, dad didn't mention that we owe three million to the bank. And uh, dad didn't mention that we're, we, you know, there's a development in the city center with, and it's a hole in the ground and we still have to, to build it out. And, uh, we were involved with a couple of different businesses. Dad had been very active as, a, as an angel investor, and he, he invested in a telecoms company, and he invested in a, in a uh, radio station, and also in a fledgling airline that had uh, joined, that had actually signed up a kind of a joint venture with Richard Branson. And so uh, this was all kind of happening, and Dad was just getting on with it. 
I wasn't part in the picture. I was going studying architecture and I was in my third year of architecture when suddenly my mom and myself were like, holy shit, what are we going to do here? My brother would, was, had just turned 18 and my sister had just turned 14. So there was a young family there and, uh, and I was kind of expected to step up to the plate and sort of get involved and take over. So it was a really difficult period because he didn't have life insurance in place and things like that. And so first lesson, have life insurance in place. And, uh, and so we had a situation where a month later, it was Christmas Day, and we were seriously wondering whether we would actually be able to keep the house. And um, because he owed three or four million to different banks, and these projects were all underway. And a te- you know, investment in a telecoms company sounds great, but the thing was just hoovering up cash. And there mm-hmm. were these rights issues, you know, we need another 100,000 from all of the investors. It was a difficult period. So... We had to divest out of a load of things that probably if he had been alive, he would have hung on into. Uh, but the real estate business was me being an architect, I kind of knew the ins and outs a little bit. And, uh, and so I eventually, when I qualified, my mom didn't want me to take over um, while I was still in college because she knew that my degree would go out the window. So she sort of said, look, I'll manage it while you finish your degree. So I went in, finished my degree in architecture because uh, just she thought it would be better if I was qualified um, just from the point of, I don't know, her, whatever mindset she had, she just thought qualified is better going into the, into the big bad world. So um, I eventually qualified and came out and took over as kind of director on the board of a family business that was actively you know, developing property all over the place. And it was a bit of a baptism of fire, you know. Okay, so just just on that point, that's really interesting because uh, this is going back to kind of how I opened up the podcast and and said about taking advice from people who are kind of telling you, guiding you through life rather than following your intuition. And the three points there, the main points that stuck out were one, you were inheriting a family business, which is something that it's almost. Yeah, you're, you're basically lumped with whether you like it or not, right? So you're kind of being pushed into a family business. Two, you're being told to get a qualification first. So that's kind of very much like, oh, qualification must mean results. And, uh, and then three, um, you're going into a business that you've just seen uh, basically have a major impact on your family and, and kind of could be, you know, you must have had some resentment towards the business, maybe, or or, with, or subconscious resentment, maybe. Well, how did you feel going into that? Yeah, it was a difficult one because um, I had actually had a conversation with my dad uh, a couple of years before that, and he was he was like a great, he was like my hero, you know what I mean? He was a great guy, very charismatic, very active. He was flying planes and he was, you know, sailing boats. So he'd sailed across the Atlantic in races and. He was a real adventurer, you know, and uh, and that's partly why he died because he had gone to Africa. He was actually he did a um, a supply flight for to Sierra Leone with a, a, like a cargo plane full of uh, relief aid during the war in Sierra Leone, and he actually flew in with another guy from Ireland, and they delivered you know so many thousand food aid packages or whatever it was. So he was into this kind of adventurous lifestyle. And which I kind of also am into as well, I have to say. But he he had said to me, before, well, you know, don't go into the family business. He said, you know, you will never get the kind of respect going into a family business that you get if you do it yourself. And so he had basically been sort of really encouraging me to do my own thing. He said, you know, he had gone into the family business behind his dad. And he said that, your dad always looks upon you or your family always looks upon you as having, you know, got a big leg up and that, you know, you don't do enough work and the other employees, they deserve the position, but you just landed in it because of who you're born, uh, because of your birth. And then the younger or the people that we work with, the employees that aren't family uh, also potentially have a chip on their shoulder thinking that, if it wasn't for, you know, who his dad is, he probably wouldn't have got that seat yeah. or whatever. So dad always has said, don't go into that business, do your own thing, you know, start your own business, become an architect, whatever it is, but don't assume that you're going to work in this business because I don't think it's a good idea. And so suddenly I'm thrown into the business and, and it's kind of like, geez, I didn't want this. Um, but, you know, I've got 
a younger brother, younger sister, and a mother that is extremely inexperienced as a business person. Like dad didn't talk about loans and all that kind of stuff with her. No. So when he died, it was like, what? You know, how much do we owe? And I mean, he had an overdraft with the bank that had grown to 60,000 when my mom opened the statement after he died. And it was like 60,000 and there was 18% interest. This was just after the currency crisis of 1989 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And like our interest rates were huge. And I think the, the, the mortgage on the house was like 14% or something like that. And uh, the, the, the overdraft was like 18%. And dad owed 60,000 on this 18% a year. Um, and so it was just a crazy time. And we were like, so it was panic stations and it was, all right, how do we shore up this? How do we like pay the mortgage? How do we keep, you know, my sister in school? Because, you know, it's obviously private school and all of that kind of stuff. How do we fit, feed the, the monster basically? And uh, so it was a nerve wracking time and we had to sell out of a load of businesses that, you know, as a family in this situation, it made 100% to be selling out. But if you or I today were asked, did we want to sell out? Of course not. We didn't want to sell out because they were all pretty much rocket ships that were going to go on to, to, to become like huge companies. And they did. But after we had gotten out of the damn things, you know, yeah. and um, like one of them went on to be bought by the telecoms company was bought by British Telecom for a billion uh, pounds. And so it's, um, I mean, we got, we had at one stage, we, I think we had 19% of the, of, the, of the shares in that company. So obviously there would have been a lot of rights issues and things, but, but we had that much of a stake when dad was alive. And then after, like we sold out for, you know, I don't know what it was pennies on the pound. It wasn't anywhere near what it's, what it went on to be. Uh. And this is what happens when you don't have life insurance. You know, if we, if dad had been better prepared to die, <laughs> like nobody thinks about it, but you never expect it to happen. And uh, you might've had a nice big windfall that you could say, right, let's sort out the mortgage. Let's sort out this. Let's make sure the school is sorted and let's hang on into this investment and, and see where it goes we don't need to sell it you know so um, i talk about cash buffers right and having some some backing some stability to just to ease that decision making process and um you know if you have that you can you can look at things a bit holistically right you can see yes. things from a from a from a bird's eye view but when you don't have that it's very much survival it's like what's the quickest way we can get the shoot you know uh, frankly the shortest the, the, the smallest amount of money back out of this deal so that we can live uh, you know short term it's it's almost yeah. like count it's almost like it's the, it's know, the lizard brain or whatever you're just reacting to everything and uh, yeah. you don't have a strategic kind of mindset at all you're thinking right I got the bills next week gotta gotta get the money where am i gonna get the money all right sell that asset you know and yeah. so we went through that for a couple of years and uh, meanwhile i I had been working as an architect and I was kind of running my, I was being involved in the family business on the side. And, um, and then what happened was my, my uncle became the chairman of the company after my dad died. And he, a couple of years later, he actually, I, I, you know, various reasons, but I didn't realize he was suffering from depression and he actually took his own life. Um, after a weekend away with me and all of the other board of directors and their and their wives and stuff, and we had this we had this great shindig in in a hotel in Ireland and we were celebrating the East Point Business Park where I'm in. It was it had finished at a certain stage, and we were kind of celebrating it. And he came home and checked into a hotel and hung himself in the hotel, and I was I was notified by the guardie that you know that could you meet me at this hotel and I, and I drove out and he gave me this passport and he says do you know this man and I opened it I said yeah that's my uncle Donald and he goes I'm sorry to tell you he's 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 dead and I was like what and what happened and he told me what had happened and I couldn't believe that I mean I just had no sort of indication at all so when that happened I became the the head of the family uh, business I was only I think 27 or something like that and um and we worked with a, the, the, there's three families that kind of work together in this business. And I became the head of one of those branches. And uh, so we're still pretty young, but we had, you know, guys that were a little bit more experienced and stuff. So the business was good. But a month after that, 
the CEO of the group died of cancer. So we went from me being kind of having a sideline involvement, not really being involved in the day to day to becoming the, you know, the head of the company. And then a month later, suddenly the CEO is dead. And so it was roll up your sleeves and come in and actually start working in the business now. And so the three families both put a person in. I was one of them. My two cousins were the other. And we went in and we started running the, the business on a day to day basis. And my, but all of my cousins also had their own businesses. Um, so uh, one of them was a house builder and he had his own house building company. I had my own little architectural business. And, uh, and I was starting to do a little bit of development in small housing schemes. And then my other cousin was kind of an investor. And uh, so the three of us were kind of just trying to figure it out. And it was, it was quite a difficult time, but I had already gone down the road of starting my own business. And so I, I was doing the two parallel. So I would run the family business. I'd be working from the office, but I'd also be dealing with clients and stuff. And it became very obvious quickly that I can't have clients for architectural work, but I can do the development stuff because it's very much in line with what I'm already doing in the family side. So I, I created this dual kind of business thing where I'd be looking, working on the big corporate stuff for the family and then I'd be working on my own business on the side. And I started getting into flipping houses and, uh, and, and developing small sites. And what actually happened was I, I, it, was a, it was a very good time to be an investor in Ireland. Everything was just growing at 25% a year. And because I was young and reckless and I had this other income now from the family business, I was able to take these like wild gambles and I was throwing darts at a dartboard blindfolded and but they were all like landing. And so, you know, I, yeah, I, I mean, some of the money that I made was just insane. And it, it just created this uh, confidence that was probably unfounded confidence. It, it was undeserved confidence. I just believed that I am a rock star now and uh, I've just made, I mean, one of the deals I made 2.5 million in two months yeah. and that money I landed into the bank and I was like, holy shit, like, okay, new car, um, got to sort out the house. Right. Why don't I buy that penthouse in New York when I'm at it? And you know, it just started to snow. Right. So, so tell it, tell us, take us a little bit back there then on the, because one of the great, th- you know, the reason I really, really wanted you to come on the podcast is to share this story because those of you who are listening, Gary actually has already been full cycle on achieving financial freedom, tons and tons of passive income, you know, millions and millions of pounds, and then literally losing the lot. And now going back full cycle. Now he's on the journey doing it the right way. And, and uh, what I really want you to, sh- the, the purpose of this podcast is to share insights and strategies that allow you to question the status quo, question what you've been told. And you heard from Gavin at the beginning there is, where he says, you know, if I had the podcast or if I had someone in my ear telling me not to be so cocky, not to be so elated or watch this or watch that. The purpose of this podcast is now so if you can listen to these stories and you're thinking like this is this is now a time where a lot of people will be getting into commercial property because we're, we're, there's going to be some great opportunities for people to get into commercial property right now. And, uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But but what we don't want you to do is make the same mistakes. Right. So so Gav, tell us a little bit about that journey. Right. So what it, things started kicking off. Ha, ha, what did your life look like? Like where where did that scale to? Uh, it just it went bonkers basically. Like I, I went from living in a in a three bedroom house um, with a young family. I had uh, a, you know a daughter of three and another daughter of just born, and and suddenly all of the deals were landing at the same time. And I had invested in I had bought a house an old house with a partner that uh, we paid 1.3 million, and we were trying to get four houses in the back garden of this house. And it took a couple of years for that to, to, to come to fruition. And it suddenly came to fruition around the same time other deals were coming to fruition. Mm. And so it was like this bonanza all at the same time. So, the, you know, we had expected to sell each of these four houses that we were building for one million each. And we ended up selling them for four million each. And so we had, you know, it was just that that's the way the market in Ireland just went yeah. crazy. Yeah. And so that brought in, you know, millions of unexpected income. And then um, I bought a, a bank property in, in, a, in a part of Dublin 
and I paid 1.2 million for it. And um, I had fully intended to develop it into an asset that I would keep. And, uh, but it was, a, it was a former bank property. And so it had a financial planning permission. Um, and that is a kind of a rare permission. And there was another financial institution that had been interested in this property. And they, I was too nimble and I had moved in and bought it while they were still thinking about it. And then I got approached by their agent who said, they want that property. You know, you moved a little bit too quickly. You're going to make a nice tidy profit now. You know, let's, let's talk numbers. And I said, it's not for sale. I don't, want to, I don't want to sell it, you know. I've got plans. I've got an architect point now. And, it, and anyway, long story short, um, 3.7 million I sold it for two months later. Wow. And I hadn't done anything to it. I mean, I literally, I had to, all I had done is appointed a couple of architects and they didn't even get any drawing done by that stage. And <laughs> it was incredible. And my, my, the total sum of money that I put into that deal was 120,000 cash. Um, that was the deposit I paid and then I borrowed all of the rest. And then I, two months later, I paid it all off and I had this profit. So that came in at the same time and then there was various other deals. So in the space of maybe, I suppose, of five years, I amassed like maybe 10 or 15 million in, in, in between equity and cash that came in. Yeah. Okay. And, and the thing is, is, is that whatever my mindset switched, I just suddenly I had this kind of burning sensation that I needed to go and reinvest it. So I had this FOMO, first of all. I didn't have, I didn't have the restraint that I should have had right. to kind of really analyze deals. Yeah. And I remember I got into CFD trading um, because a friend of mine told me, oh, I just made 40,000, you know, on, on a trade. And I was like, what? You can do that, you know? And so I started buying into gold companies and oil companies. And while I was, <laughs> while all this money was coming in, I was. I, I decided to, I'll throw. I try my hand at CFD trading, and and I put 150 grand into a bank account, and three. I think three or four months later, it was 850 grand in value, and uh, it had just shot up because the share prices were these penny yeah. stocks. Like they, there was 20. I think I bought them at like 15 cents or something, and it was now 50 cent. Whatever it was, it jumped seven seven x my money basically in a couple of months. And suddenly I was like, holy shit, I'm on fire. You know, I'm just, I'm a rock star. And so yeah. I remember when I was going to, I was going on holiday to Spain and I would actually, I would call the airport and they have this special area that like the likes of Tom Cruise when he was traveling to Ireland would use. And it was like a VIP section and you could pick up the phone and you can actually book that. So I would arrive in and I parked my car in the, like the front of the car, of the car park at the airport and I'd walk in and we'd have a private room where the kids could watch like DVDs while we were waiting for the plane. And the guys would go off with my passport and do all of the stuff and get the tickets. And then they would drive you in a BMW to the steps of the airplane and you'd go up with everyone else. And this is how I was arriving at the airplane. Like, and I remember thinking like, you know, it was just gone bonkers, you know, and yeah. I thought this was all normal. I didn't have someone saying, you know slapping me no, so there. so you was completely blind to that whole elation of that market right and and how it was getting too uh, where it was too good to be true you wasn't you, you was blind to that you was you was only conscious of the of the good you wasn't you was unconscious to the downsides and yeah the, uh, it was like we were all smoking the same euphoria pipe and <laughs> everyone believed and i mean i was only like i mean that's it might sound very lavish what i was doing but like compared to like there was guys buying helicopters and Bentleys and all sorts of stuff. So I was actually quite conservative comparatively, but I had this thing. I mean, so I went from the three bedroom house to a six bedroom mansion with its own wine cellar and basement gym. And like, it was a mega house, like a mansion. And I was 35 years of age, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and then I bought a, a house in Spain so that I could, uh, have the family home down in Spain. And I had a penthouse in New York City, right in the Rockefeller Center. And it was just this kind of lifestyle. And the problem is, is that, and this is where I, I try to advise people now to, you know, tamp, tamp all that stuff down, is that your, your outcome in the real estate business, you can manipulate the figures, you can manipulate the deal to suit you. And I know guys that want, to, like they would order a Ferrari and they'd be building a building and what they would do is they would give the Ferrari, you know, the cost of the Ferrari, they would give that to their quantity surveyor and he would build it in 
to the next uh, thing so that the, basically the bank would pay for so much of the yeah. building to be done, but it would include his car in that payment, you know? Yeah. There's all these tricks that people were doing. But I, what I realize now is that the decisions you to take and the, and the actions that you take today bake in your outcome three to five years from now in this business. And so if you're not super, super disciplined, you can easily go off. Like you want a new watch. I mean, I see you guys on, you know, all these kind of gurus now kind of talking about how yeah. easy it is to make your money on in property and stuff. And it's just such bullshit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And like the reality is in the morning I can have, you know, a flash Patek Philippe watch on and I can be driving a Bentley. I can have that in the morning if I want, but what you're doing is you're sacrificing, you know, three or four years from now, the outcome. And yeah. so guys are just paying themselves forward. And the problem is, is that three years from now, the market could change. Nobody predicted COVID-19 coming back in December. You could have gone and decided, oh, I want to you know, buy myself a, a nice holiday and a new watch back yeah. then. But, say, it, but saying that, looking at the market, the actual high of the market was in December. So if you understand, you know, where to, to look for a bear market and, um, you know, if you try and if you've got your wits about you, you can you can appreciate that actually we're slightly over related at the moment in the markets or, you know, you might want to be wary about putting too much money in that market or this market because the previous high was in December and it wasn't until March that we realized we was in a, in a, in a recession and that's because we hit 20% decline but you just don't know unless you know what you're looking for and all you see is the good side so when you was doing the property was you building up any passive income you know was there any passive income coming in did you you did you have tenants did you or was it just flip 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 no no i was I, by that stage i had grown a portfolio I, I had a big portfolio in my personal capacity separate completely from the family business and i had grown it to about 65 million in assets and i had um I had commercial property, you know, throughout the city, and I had all of these different. So I, I was doing a lot of joint ventures with um, certain financial institutions, and those guys were doing. They were trying to offload all of their assets and do sale and leasebacks. So I was going in and I was doing a, a deal where I would acquire their property, completely refurbish it, and put them back into the property on a 25-year lease. And so I did this multiple times. And I had like, in the region of about 800,000 a year in passive income coming from these different investments. I mean, one, one property alone was paying me uh, 397,000 a year in rent. And it was four checks a year, no involvement in the running of the property whatsoever. And these guys, uh, you know, every quarter the payment would come in. So I'd have 100 grand more or less hit the bank account. And that was it. That's all I had to do is just check that it was there. And they looked after the repairs. They looked after the insurance. Everything was managed by them. And that was what I was trying to do. So I had created these things around the place. And, but at the same time, in order to kind of grow more aggressively, I was buying land that I could develop. And when you can develop the land, you can have, you know, four X returns. When you buy those kind of assets, generally you don't have that big four X return. You can, you buy it at, a million and maybe you can hope that it'll grow to 1.5 or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and you've got the nice steady income and you're paying it down your debt over time. And I had thought to myself, I'm pretty conservative in, um, like I had debt of maybe about 40 million on my 65 million portfolio. So I was wealthy uh, by all accounts and, and I thought I had plenty of cover. Like if the market was to drop by 30%, I'd still be, above water you know yeah to drop by 50 then i'd be in trouble the market in ireland dropped by 80 percent in some places and so i ended up 16 million negative at um at the lowest point right and that's when it really turned nasty yeah. and they're coming out so, from every angle you know tell tell us a little bit about that then what started to go wrong you know what what how did all this unfold for you it went if wrong you can go back there. it's yeah it's like therapy here you know? yeah the, I think where, where, where it started to go wrong, first of all, the CFDs, um, they, they went pear-shaped on me. And I can remember it being, um, you know, the, I think I bought in March or something like that, this 100 grand or 150 grand's worth of shares in the oil and the gold. And that by, by June, 
I was in the Porsche dealership looking at specking out a new 911 for myself because it, it had risen to 850 grand. And I was thinking I can buy like a top of the line Porsche for myself and still have half a million in the bank. Yeah. And I was, you know, thinking this is great. And then um, suddenly then the market, I can't remember what exactly happened, but there was a bit of a correction in the market and it fell. And I think it fell from 850 to about 750 grand in the space of like two days or something like that. And I can remember saying, oh shit, you know, and I thought, no, no, it's going to turn around and it's going to go back and I'll, and I'll exit the whole thing at a million. And that's as scientific as I was. Okay. <laughs> it's going to go to a million. That's, you know, lick my finger yeah. and stick it in the I've air. Decided, I've <laughs> decided that market is going to go to Yeah. A I have decided that's where I'm going to exit. <laughs> and anyway, and so I watched this, decline slow decline and i remember thinking no no i don't want to i want to go back to the 850 i don't want to sell at 750 and then it fell to 650 and i no, no, it's going to go back to 750 and i watched it go down 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 and i met, kept on thinking that no there's going to be a bounce back and like the reason i went to 850 those those realities are still there so it should go back to 850 you know and I was just playing this stupid like game in my head that yeah. I remember I had this trading screen where it's going red and green and all this kind of stuff. And like I was a fully engaged development business, you know, and so I'd be out at meetings and meeting architects and lawyers and stuff. And then I'd come in at five thirty or six o'clock and I'd turn on the screen to see like red, red flash. I remember thinking, looking at it and it fallen another 80 or a hundred thousand. And I can remember thinking, geez, and I was, I, I still didn't want to sell. And then I went on holiday to Spain, to, to my house in Spain. And it was, um, it, I can remember clearly the getting a call and it was, it was my birthday and I was down at this beach club and my kids were running around. We were having a great time. And I get a call and it's the CFD guy, uh, the, the, you know, IG markets or whatever. Yeah, margin call. Margin call. 80,000 in the bank or we're going to have to close out your position. And I was just like, what? And he said, yeah, it's been a big fall today. You went from 250 to minus 80 and we need you to cover the position tonight. And I can remember, like I'm on holiday and my kids are running around, like talk about ruining your birthday. Mm. And uh, I can remember I had to ring my, my PA back in Dublin and I had to tell her, will you go and organize like a, a, a transfer to this thing? And it's 80,000 to do. So I did that and then um, went back to the holiday and uh, before, you know, three days had passed, they came back onto me. We need another 50,000. And, uh, and I can remember going, are you kidding me? I just gave you 80 and it was 130 negative now. And anyway, I exited at negative 250. Uh, that's when I just offloaded the entire portfolio. Right. And so it was just closed out on me. And so that was so that was a big humbling point, right? Because up until now, you've been really cocky with property, and you've you know you, you think you're, you're Superman, and you're doing CFDs, and you there's no way that you could possibly believe that you could you could fail at any investment that you tried your hand at. And this was the first point where it went. You know what? You need to learn. You need to be humbled, right? You need to be brought back to balance. So yeah. how did that open your eyes? Well, I mean, it was first of all, it's extremely uh, distressing. Distracting. I mean, from your day job, I can yeah. remember, you know, because we didn't have the apps on the phone where you can check the share price. So you'd be, you know, you'd be going into the office and turn it on the screen and it's all red and you just be kind of like, and that would it be it then. You couldn't concentrate on your job any longer. Yeah. So yeah. it was just, it was this. Yeah. So when I got out of that, I was like, okay, go back to concentrating on making the big money and the property stuff. And so that was around about 2007 when that happened. So the market was still frothy and I, some of the properties that I had bought um, had like really done well. And so I bought something for, for 5.7 million and I had an offer on the table to sell it for 8.8 .8 and I'd only owned it for about six months. So I was like, okay, this will right the ship. Um, this is like a 2.8 million profit or whatever it was. It was some profit in that region. And I thought I'll take that out and I'll, you know, I'll shore up everything and that'll be fine. And then there was another property I bought and I was looking at making about 1.5 million profit on that. And so those two, I decided to sell those and that would put 5 million into the bank more or less, give or take. And I thought this would be fine. So then I went back about my business. And at this stage I had, I had bought the adjoining property to my, to my big mansion that I had. 
and I was going to build an even bigger house and I was going to build an eight and a half thousand square foot mansion and it was going to have, I don't even remember all that, but it was going to be worth something like eight million and, and I was going to have no mortgage on it because I had enough money to pay down the debt on that and to sell my own property and make the profit on that. And it, so the whole idea made a lot of sense, but it was all built on this kind of like the market continuing to rock yep. the way it was Assumption, going. right? Assumption. It was a big assumption. Yeah. Exactly. So there was no negative testing. And what if this all goes, you know, to the, to the ground? Like what's it going to look like? So in the end, I remember just, in a long story short, I had to, I was forced to sell both properties, okay? And I sold them for maybe one third or one fourth of what they were worth and or what they had been valued at when I started looking at all this stuff. And, um, and it just, it just started all to kind of go to hell. And the, the deals that I was selling was to create this 5 million buffer that I was going to pay everything in. That those, both of those deals fell by the wayside because suddenly the American banks, the, Lehman hadn't started yet, but there was already this subprime kind of like um, rumors and things like that starting mm. to filter out there. And I started to get nervous and I started thinking, shit, this is actually gathering momentum. And I was watching it really carefully and I knew this is all going to come crashing down. I got to start moving quickly to exit. And uh, those two deals, they both fell by the wayside and that threw a real spell in the works. Suddenly you're not getting the 5 million you expected to have. And then you're thinking, well, what else am I going to sell? And the whole thing then just started like a house of cards just to start crumbling. And I was in Spain. I was, by this stage, I was living in Spain. And I, was on a, I started a project, a, ha a big commercial shopping center in the south of Spain. And I had put $3 million of cash into that deal. And I had gotten investors, uh, $9 million from the investors. So the total was $12 million of equity. And we had a, a bank loan from the Royal Bank of Scotland of $30 million. And, uh, and this was a big commercial deal. And I had mm. Gucci and Armani and Ralph Lauren, all of these brands were interested coming into the deal. And then suddenly this all started to fall apart as well. And I was getting calls from the guys saying, look, Gavin, we've got a whole restructuring of the business. We're not paying any capital on fitting out new business. We're, we're just reconsolidating the existing. And I said, like, what about, you know, we, you said you were going to go into my shopping center and say, yeah, unless you're going to give us the money to fit out our store, we're not going to. And Gucci would usually put in about $2 million into their fit out of a store because it's all marble. And all this. So it was a total disaster. And basically everything just started to kind of fall at the same time. Wow. And um, now, thankfully, I still had a couple of deals and, and, and I, I did one deal and I brought in 700000 and that kind of shored up things for a while. But then uh, just it was just this constant negative news and the problem is you kind of think to yourself okay it'll go on for another year maybe so i've got my 700 grand i've got a buffer i'm in good shape and then a year would come and it was still just as negative and and the whole recession in ireland went on for about six years and so like no buffer mm. was going to outlive that kind of duration no. and uh, and so i ended up you know 16 million negative and i had guys chasing me and i actually my, my buffer ran out and i started having to go and look for work and so I went, I was in Dubai working on a project and then I went to Qatar and Africa and I was doing all this uh, to bring in, you know, the money to basically like keep the show on the road and to pay down debt and to try to meet investors that could invest in, you know, deals that I could still mm. see that were opportunities. And uh, the whole thing just really got very difficult. And my marriage actually collapsed as a result of that because I was, I'd be away for three or four weeks at a time working solid on, on a project and then I'd be coming back for two weeks and then I have to go again. And so that brought with it a lot of strain on yep. my marriage. And so, you know, by the end of that six year period, I had been seriously humbled. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's, it's a good thing that I have the resilience that I, I kind of developed this resilience and it's mostly around my fitness. And I, I put a lot of attention into staying yeah. and then keeping the mind kind of like strong because I like I know of seven or eight people who took their lives during right, that period yeah. of time because their whole ego was tied up in their you know persona as the wealthy guy, and and I I kind of created a different alter ego and I decided that I was going to be the, the fittest guy that you know, um, yeah. as opposed to the wealthiest guy you know. You yeah, know? And that's, that's that, amazing. 
Yeah, that's that's very. I mean, this 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 podcast is very much in in the message of the podcast is wealth is time, right? And and the time to be alive as long as possible and be healthy and vibrant and have the experiences that you want for you and your loved ones and live an inspired life. So, um, you know, being able to that whole ego thing that gets people enslaved or entrapped in a assumed wealth is not life happiness thing. it's not yeah. happiness it's uh it can, it can have that domino effect that you just said that happened to you but how do you stay you know how did you stay res- like what's going through your head like how do you stay so positive and resilient in that whole process well you know, when, when I, all you'd known is is your god up until that point it's it's well first of all it's pretty humbling um but the second of all is that I mean, it, it wasn't so positive the whole time. I did have dark moments um, when it was really hard, you know, and, and I can remember at least two or three times during that period of time, um, not contemplating it, but understanding how people make the decision sure. to take their yeah. own lives. Yeah. I could actually, so much was happening at the same time that I can remember just thinking, God, if I didn't have three kids right now i would just do it you know yeah. what i mean and i because I, actually the problem with having gone through my previous experience with my uncle taking his life he had three young kids and i watched that family having to you know survive yeah. through that that moment and it was extremely difficult for that family and i used to to go and i used to advise his what his widow and um, because i was now running the business and so they had an investment in the business and I used to go and meet her to kind of explain, you know, what we're doing with the business and reassure her that everything was going to be fine and all that. And I remember seeing the struggles that they were going through. And so, you know, when you see that, you, you kind of remove yourself from the situation and you see what damage it leaves behind. And then I kind of, I thought to myself, you know what, I'll get through this. I might be a different person at the other side. I'll probably be a better person at the other side of this. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, it's it certainly, if, do I, did I want to go through that experience? No, but no. now I'm basically turning it into a positive, uh, insofar as I can share this story and I can maybe educate some people out there that are possibly going down that same road. Incredible. And, so, and, you know, try to avoid the mistakes that I made. Right. So that is it, right? So that's what, that's what we'll come on to now then. Um, we're in a recession now. Okay, we're we we're, we're on a decline, and although the markets pick back up a little bit, I suspect we're going to see another fall, uh, particularly on next when we see the next quarter two quarter two earnings. I think we're going to see a, another drop, uh, just based on the last nine recessions in the last hundred years. We we usually, on average, hit around forty percent decline. Um, uh, back then, okay, so you're riding the wave, and you're riding the wave, and then when it all crashes you don't have any money. In fact, you owe money, right? And it was very hard for you to be in a position back then to go, you weren't even thinking like, if I had money now, I would do this, that and that. And I'd take this opportunity. And I'd do things differently. Cause you probably wasn't even thinking that you was probably thinking, how the hell am I going to, you know, just get my head above water for a while. Um, we're going into that situation right now. And the question that I've got for you is a couple of questions, really. First of all, how would you approach if if you had the opportunities now and and you're going into property and commercial property what would you be looking for right now because now's a great time to potentially if you play your cards right and what mistakes do people make in property when they're looking to invest what kind of false hopes have they got or what mistakes do they make and what opportunities are there now how would you do it if you had all of that money back then and you'd ridden the crash down and then you had a load of cash and now you're like, right, let's, let's take advantage of this. Cause the, the information yeah. that you've got, the insights you've got, are, you know, by far better than anyone else I know in, in commercial space. So uh, I'm excited to hear your thoughts. Well, I tell you what, first of all, at the time I was still, you know, I was trying to correct my situation with a big deal that would actually bail me out of you if you want and, and I remember, so I was scouring the, the property pages and I was looking for deals. And the problem is that, that there's this thing that I call capitulation. And that is the point where people, they, they have that fantasy price in their head. It's like me watching my house go down in value uh, or my, my CFD can going down in value. Yeah. Is that you believe that you're worth this and you do not want to accept that is, you've lost 100000 or whatever. Yeah. 
And so there is that moment of capitulation when people suddenly accept that their situation has materially changed and they are no longer the, you know, at that fantasy price that they've been holding out for. When that happens, suddenly everyone starts to flood the market with their properties. And I think that is going to happen. You're going to see, first of all, there's always a property lag. The, the property market always lags behind the central kind of economy. Yeah. And, and it's because of the fact that there's debt and that the rent gets paid later and, and all this. Yeah. And you can actually kick the, you can kick the ball down the road a bit. And the banks don't start coming, looking for, you know, you don't get thrown out of your property overnight. There's a process. So I would say it'll be... And how long is that? Six to 12 months? Yeah, it can be anything from that. It depends on how severe the downturn. In this particular case, it's a very, very severe downturn. And I think a lot of people realize that. And so I think it could be quicker in this case. But you've got, you know, I know some of the figures in Ireland anyway are that 30% of pubs and restaurants will just simply not reopen. Um, so all of a sudden you've got a huge amount of commercial property out there that is no longer got a tenant. And so you're going to, how are you going to find a tenant for that property? Because there's not many people starting a new business in this environment. Okay. And so you're just going to have an empty property. And one of the big mistakes that I've saw in the past was people going off and buying empty properties thinking it's a bargain. Okay. It's a bargain because it's empty. And in three years time, it might still be empty. And you've really got to be careful about that because I did, I, two of the worst, um, the two worst words, worst bits of advice I ever got were no brainer. Okay. And uh, I got, <laughs> I looked at a deal with a good friend of mine and we looked at it and we said, this is a no brainer. And we bought it and we had a tenant that we were talking to, but hadn't signed a, a binding lease. And they were like, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. And they sent in an architect to like measure it up and all this. And at the end, um, we bought the property on that kind of action from the tenant thinking that they haven't hired an architect like to kind of walk away. So yeah. secure. So, and it was a no brainer on the basis they were going to go in. We were going to immediately turn two or 300 grand in profit. And um, what happened unexpectedly was the adjoining property, a, a planning permission notice went up on it. And the architect noticed it and rang his client and said, did you know the next door property have just applied for planning permission for the same use as what this one is? And it was a convenience store. So it was going to be two convenience stores next to one another. And as soon as they saw that, they said, oh, pull out of the deal. And that was it. And so we were stuck with owning the property with no tenant. And I can tell you that I think we owned that property for seven years and we didn't have a tenant for seven years wow. and we were paying interest for seven years and kept on thinking that we would get it to get the tenant. We did get a tenant and it was like one of these like fast food restaurants and they opened and within six months they closed, and, you know, that was it. So it was a total disaster. And I can remember. So when people are looking at prices over the, when this capitulation takes place and prices start to fall, you should go along to the kind of the likes of the all sops auctions and start looking at the properties that are coming up for sale. But if it's sitting empty, be very careful. Don't assume, yeah. unless it's in a really prime location, and it's unlikely that it will be um, if, if for sale there, if it's in a prime location. The next thing is your tenant risk. So we've all, got, we've all seen what COVID has done. It's shut down gyms, bars, restaurants, everything. So is your tenant going to be in essential service. If it is, then you've got far more strength. Mm. So the likes of a convenience store or a grocery store, those places have not closed. In fact, they're doing better than ever. So yeah. you've got a pretty solid business there. And then things like the banks that I used to work with, like a bank, a financial institution is not going bust. So right. you can have a nice 25 year lease and that's just whether they close the branch for five years or not, they can still afford their rent. So yeah. that is a solid, so this, you know, the, the income, solid income, that is what you want. And um, I mean, that's the first thing that you look for and you will see some distress and you will get bargains that are unbelievable. Yeah. I, mean, I, I saw stuff and the problem is, is, and it's like, you'd be well familiar with the old statement um, buy when, be greedy when everyone's being fearful and, and the road yeah. and the reverse of that. And I can remember, I was, I was living in Qatar at the time and I saw a deal in Dublin. It was a big office building and great tenants and everything like that. And it was for sale at a yield of 22%. Wow. 
And uh, so you buy this building in under five years, you fully repay for, for investing. And um, I remember thinking this is like a no brainer like ever before. And so I went, I, I, I was told my friend and I, we agreed we'd never use the term again okay, after seven years. But um, the, uh, I, went, I was living in Qatar and I had you know, friends in the royal family and stuff. And, and I went to them and I said, this is you know, a bargain of a lifetime. You've got to come and invest in Ireland. And they could see all the headlines. The IMF were, had been appointed to like, oversee the government's budget and all that. And it was just such a negative story. They could not see Ireland pulling out of it. And so they said no. And like a, a German fund came in and bought that at 22.6% yield. And then a big company called Kennedy Wilson, which is a big American private equity fund, um, they came in and they started buying in Dublin when nobody would touch anything. And they bought up billions in loans from the banks, bad debt loans. And, and those guys have, I'd say they've 10x to their money easily. And, and it's all because they came in when nobody would yeah. touch it. And so that is, but obviously they, you know, they had the resources to do that. So you do have to work on your buffer, make sure that you're ready to go. I've been advising the various people are asking me is that probably you're better to get collectively work together. Because if you, if you and I and a couple of friends were to get together, instead of us buying one property, we can buy one big property between us and we can have you know, a seventh share each. And when you've got a bigger property, say you own, instead of owning one apartment building, you, uh, instead of owning one apartment, you own the whole building. And so you now own 12 apartments with yep. 12 investors. It means that if, if three of them get furloughed and stop paying their rent, you've still got nine paying your debt. Yeah. So you've diversified, you know. So working with, you know, partners or in, a, in some sort of a JV kind of a thing, that's the way I yeah. approach a lot yeah. of them. Yeah. I, I always say, look, I'd rather have less of a lot than a lot of less. So yeah. I, it's much more sustainable. I would much rather have a smaller piece of the pie that is diversified and sustainable than a big piece of a, of a, of a little pie, right? So uh, wise words. So, okay, so if we're going into commercial property, things that are going to, you know, timeless kind of businesses, like that are going to stand through uh, the longevity of, of, of coronavirus and any other pandemic, like uh, grocery stores, as you say, even logistic companies and things like that. I think they're busy. Oh, yeah. ever. Um, is for sure. Yeah. Pharm pharmacies, those kind of, those kind of businesses. And when we get back to normal, even like, you know, hair salons and decent long lasting hair salons and things like that. So what about in terms of commercial property going into residential then, because I can see a lot of commercial properties being bought up to then turn into residential properties. Well, I mean, there's, there's various pros and cons to it. I mean, this, the family business that I'm in, we have got a very big, you know, office park here and we have a lot of tenants and they're multinationals. And so we have no risk obviously from those guys going bust. Although some of them have asked us for, you know, uh, to, to give, can we have a, a quarter's rent pushed into next year? So they're looking for cash flow assistance. But if you were to buy residential, you can have a residential that is, you know, as we said, diversified. We are looking at buying, an, uh, we have a site to build 100 apartments in a single block. And rather than sell that uh, to the market, we just think, hold on to it. And it's a great, yeah. great bit of income. To convert commercial to residential, that is interesting to do, but it, you know, there's a certain scale where it only makes sense. You need a team. I mean, it depends on how active or passive you are. If you're, wanna, if you're looking for, as you're you know, always free and having a lot of free time on your hands, residential is not always great because you know, the washing machine is busted. You've got to go and organize that. So you can obviously have property manager do that for you. But whereas if you've got, say, a, you know, a collective of people and you buy 100 apartments, you can actually employ two or three people to just run that entire business. Yeah. And you yeah. can completely walk away from it. And uh, now with a commercial lease, you have a, a thing called an FRI, um, full repair and insure lease. And what that means is that the tenant is 100% responsible for all that. They pay you three months in advance, four times a year, and that's your, your involvement. And if, the, if a tree blows down and puts in their front windows, they're responsible for repairing it and all that. So right. it's very, very passive from that point of view. And that's one of the reasons why I tend to, to go in that direction conversions and things like that. I mean, I'm not going to advise 
um, because it's if there's too many specific kind of rules and regulations around. Yeah. Um, but it is. Don't, you know, don't worry. Nothing's advice on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, I would. You just you do have to be thread carefully. I do think that it's probably best to buy into a certain area of the market that you're familiar with so that you can get like real expertise in that yeah. specific space. And then when some law changes, you're aware of it. If you're what I did before, spraying my capital everywhere, you end up a master of nothing, you know? And what you want to be is a master of, of a certain area where you have, you know, very, very solid knowledge of that area rather than being spread out so thin that you have to just listen to the advice of lots of different yeah. people to know what you're doing next. You know? All right. Well, look, mate, I know we're, I'm conscious of time. We've been going on for a while and uh, some phenomenal insights there. And I, and I just, I, I hope everyone's as kind of refreshed as I am listening to Gavin because he, he really has, you know, he's been there, done it. He's bought the t-shirt and just take from it that, you know, even in Gav's position where he had, like he thought the world was his oyster and he was really, you know, on top of the world, or perceived to be at the top of the world. And, um, and, and now he's saying like, if I had someone on my shoulder or my ear telling me this, that and the other to bring me back down to balance, you know, I would have done a lot better and really just listen to what Gavin said. If you're thinking about going into property, you know, think uh, objectively, think tangibly and think, uh, what, think five years, 10 years, and think about your, your freedom of time and think about if you ever feel like something's too good to be true, uh, it probably is. Try and see the downsides in that before you make a decision because you know, your mind is always conscious, fully conscious, but you're, you've, because of splits, you're blind to one side a lot of the time. You're blind to the downsides or you're blind, blind to the upsides. And just by taking the time, as I said at the beginning, to just ask yourself questions, ask yourself questions and, and, and go for a process of fully answering those questions, you know, to yourself will help you make better decisions. So Gav, I know you've just recently launched your own podcast. Um, for those listeners who are really interested in commercial property, I don't believe there's a better person to, to learn from than yourself. Tell us a little bit about where people can find you. Uh, well, the, the, the podcast is called Behind the Facade. And um, it's Great. all about what goes on behind your head and behind the, the bullshit front that you put on. And, uh, and I talk about, you know, the mindset, the mentality, the, the mental game, unconscious and conscious and subconscious that goes on yeah. in the property business. And a lot of the stuff that I spoke about today, I go into those kind of into, into a little bit more detail in yeah. them. And I try to just point out the, the pitfalls, the benefits, the opportunities out there and that kind of thing. And, um, and it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a kind of a real estate focused uh, podcast, but I think a lot of the lessons could be applied pretty much anywhere. Yeah, universal yeah. principles, right? Well, that's uh, it's it. amazing. It's such a great name as well. And it sums up the, everything we've just spoke about, right? Just behind yeah. the facade. Such a great name. Um, listen, mate, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thanks for coming on to uh, Always Free. And uh, if anyone wants to check out Gav's podcast, it's called Behind the Facade. And uh, on, in, on you on social media, Gav? Yeah, if you want to find me on social media, it's Gavin J. Gallagher. Uh, Gavin J. Gallagher. James was my grandfather and I got that middle name. That's the typical Irish thing. So I use the J because I think there's like 47 Gavin Gallagher's out there. 47 million Gavin yeah. Gallagher's, yeah. <laughs> no, excellent. It's a bit like Jay Greystone. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But, no, um, thanks a lot for, for coming on, mate. Guys, I hope you take something away from this podcast. And uh, if you think that anyone you know will get value from this, please do share it. And it, it, as I say, if this is the first episode you've listened to, go back and listen at the beginning. But most importantly, if you get value from this, give a little review on iTunes, get, share the love. I do read through those, uh, every single one of them. And it does inspire me to keep this podcast going. I enjoy doing it. And uh, it's, it's amazing to see how many lives we're changing or minds were shifting and it's a, it's an amazing feeling so until next week guys have a great rest of your day and weekend and i'll see you then
subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. For news on all future events and updates, go to jasongraystone.com.